Lord. Come on, give him a shout this morning. Shout that you love him and that you have been found by God. Hallelujah. How many of you are excited about this new year? How many of you would say, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. You're going to do new things this year that you didn't do last year. You're going to finish things this year that you started last year. God, you're going to bless more abundantly this year than you did last year. You're going to open new pathways that weren't there last year, but you're going to do them this year. You see, we can enter his courts with praise and thanksgiving. And when we do that, we set our path straight for the day. We actually set the tone for the day as we worship first thing in the morning. Now, how many of you would agree with that? We set the tone for the day, and it's by our confession. It is by the words that come from our mouths. Whether we feel it or not, when we confess things by faith, they happen. And in fact, God takes our hearts and corrects them and hones them and, and focuses them in the right direction. So I want you to be able to do that. I want you to be able to believe that God can change the direction of your heart this morning. If it's, if it's going askew, man, take, take, take hold of it now in Jesus' name, in the worship, and redirect it where God wants it to go. And if there were resources that got wasted last year, how many of you know God can multiply back seven times what you think you lost last year and give it to you this year? How many of you believe that? Come on and say hallelujah. Because the scripture says that God will restore seven times what the enemy has stolen. Anybody remember that scripture here? Come on, say hallelujah then. And so we shout not just to shout, we shout the truth because we believe it. That's why we shout. We worship because in heaven there's worship going on before the Lord. How many of you knew that? And so we mimic and mirror what's going on in heaven because worship is always before the Lord because he is always new every morning. And so much as we believe when we get into heaven that it, it's sort of all over, it's actually all beginning. It's all beginning. Eternity is beginning when we get to heaven. And there's always going to be a time and a place to worship God. There's always going to be something else that we're learning about him. There's always going to be something else to be hopeful about. And that's how I want you to begin this year. Hopeful for the rest of the year. Not looking back saying, oh my God, that was awful and I lost all these things. Don't do it. Grab hold of it and say, whatever I, might, I think I might have lost, God's going to repay this year. Come on. Whatever I think I lost last year, God's going to repay seven times this year in Jesus' name. Come on. <laughs> if I think I lost some health last year, God's going to give it back seven times this year. If I think I lost business last year, God's going to repay it seven times this year. If I lost relationships that were valuable to me last year, I believe God's going to replace them seven times this year. This year. And so let's consecrate this year for God. How about that? And we say, God, we know that you're a God of abundance, and therefore, when we give you this year, you're going to take it and multiply it and multiply the seed we've sown in your kingdom. And that's our lives for this year. I know that's big. I know it's going to sound big. It's going to feel big. But then when you do that, God's going to give you direction as to what he wants you to do. How many of you want God's agenda this year? Come on, say hallelujah. I want God's agenda this year. I don't want my plans, I want his will. And I want his will to be perfected in my life more this year than any other year. No, we never get it perfect, but we keep striving for it to get more and more perfected. And so let's pray this morning because I just want to start with a, a heart of thanksgiving for God, but also a joy that he's going to do something special this year for each and every one of us. Somebody say hallelujah. He's going to do it. He's going to do it. Just grab hold of it. Heavenly Father, we grab hold by faith. And your word says that you would repay, you would restore seven times what the enemy has stolen, assuming he's stolen anything. But God, we are thankful for 2020, for the things that you've shown us, for the revelations that have come, even in dark things that have been uncovered. God, we thank you that you've done that. And Lord, even in the midst of a pestilence, God, you said if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray that you would hear from heaven, you would forgive their sins, and you would heal their land. How many of you want this land to be healed in Jesus' name? I wanted you to know the context of Chronicles. It was in the midst 
He said, if I allow pestilence to come, then my people would bow their knees and they would look at the signs of the times and they would pray to God and reconsecrate themselves to him. That's the context of that scripture. I mean, how appropriate. How appropriate. And God, we're not afraid of what's coming. We look forward to the light that's going to come in the midst of any darkness that we see. We thank you, God, that you are going to bring tighter relationships in the body of Christ. You're going to renew our spirit and our passion for the kingdom. And you're going to set us free of the things that might have encumbered us in 2020. God, we say all these things and we thank you for your abundant heart because that's what you want to do. It's your will and that's your agenda for us this year in 2021. And we thank you and praise you. And we do so in Jesus' mighty name. And all who agree with that prayer said, come on, give him a praise this morning. And let's continue to worship the Lord.
church hallelujah god is good and he's awesome and this year is going to be his this year is going to be his because we're going to dedicate it to him now in jesus name each of us in our hearts consecrating the year to him because it's his to begin with just like your life when we tithe we give back what he gave us how many of you can say amen to that we, we, you, you didn't come up with anything. He came up with everything, and he only asked for 10%. That's life with God. Life with God is just full of so much of what he does for us, and he asks just a little thing back from us. And in, in exchange, he gives us such great abundance. That's just the way I believe God is. I believe he is that God of abundance. In other words, he is more abundant than I am. He's got more than I could ever give him, and he's always willing to give me more than I've ever given him. He's the one that's always willing to give more, the one that's always willing to forgive, the one that's always willing to be more patient. Can anybody say amen? Is that the God that you experience? The one that doesn't beat us over the head when we mess up? Just, just as Mike said, he says, come on, child, get up. Come on. I bled on that cross so that you could say you could say you're sorry and believe it in your heart and be forgiven. That's why I bled on that cross, so you can get back up. Somebody say amen. amen. That's why he did it. And for us not to, to partake of it, for us not to repent, for us not to ask forgiveness, is to not understand the Father's heart. It's to not get it. That's why you go to your parents. I love the song that they sang. You know, just we run back to the Father over and over and over and over again. And that's a good thing. Because I never feel like my, my daddy's door is closed. I never feel like, oh, I, this is once too many. I always feel like I can run back to him. And there's a certain level of grounding and foundation that that gives you. And even when other people can't forgive you, you know that you're forgiven. You know that you're accepted, even when they don't accept you. They don't agree with you. They don't believe what you believe, but that's okay. You know why? Because God still loves you. See, that strength is one of the things that's going to help us stay together as a church and as a body of Christ. It's the strength of knowing that God loves you so you can be different from someone else. You can be different and still love them. You can be different and, and be okay with it, not needing to be the popular one, but endeavoring to be the one that hears God. That's a lonely place. It's not always going to be that everybody agrees with you. We're, I believe we're moving into a prophetic season right now. Hallelujah. I just believe we are. Because as I was praying, God's like, you, you, you need to tell people that they should be prophesying over one another. That's what he said. I'm not going to editorialize it beyond that. That's what he said. And in the midst of that, he was saying, he said to me, he said, you need to prophesy over your kids. And the implication was, well, you haven't been, and you haven't. You haven't done enough. That was the implication. I was like, okay, God, then I need to prophesy over my kids. And, and a couple of them will say to you that, yeah, he, it was, Dad asked me a really strange question the other day. He asked me a really strange question. It was, what's God's mission for your life? Where does God want to take you? See, because it matters where God wants to take you. How many of you agree with that? It matters more what his agenda is than what your plan is. His agenda matters more than you ever want to give credit to him for. And, and the more you resist it or don't ask about it or forget to ask the question, what is God's agenda for me? The more lost you're going to be and you're going to wonder where the year went and why, why didn't I achieve anything. Well, start up now. Start now. 
And you know you can prophesy over your own life. How many of you know that? Do you know how you do it? You listen to the Holy Spirit and you speak what he spoke. Come on, somebody say hallelujah. Hallelujah. You listen to the Holy Spirit. You don't need me to prophesy over you, but I might have a word that you're not getting. And, and I'm one of those guys that's like, I don't need a pro- prophet when I got the Holy Ghost. I don't. I feel 90% of the time, if I'm, if I'm listening to God and I have the Holy Spirit in my life, I really don't need you to prophesy over my life unless I'm just being hard-headed and God needs you to tell me. Somebody say amen. And, and yes, that's a backstop. That's a, that's a safety valve. And, and yes, pastors need that they, because we have blind spots. We all do. And we can't see everything. Or sometimes we're being stubborn and you need somebody to speak into your life. But that's not, the, that's not God's highest and best. You do understand that God would rather tell you himself. How many of you agree with that? I'm seeing some head. No, God would rather talk to you. And he would rather you hear from him. That's what he wants. He wants that intimacy of relationship where he can actually tell you what he wants personally. How many of you know Adam walked in the cool of the day with the Lord? Why? <laughs> Why? Why did he do that? Why would So in other words, pastor, you're telling me that, that Adam, at the end of the day, or even the beginning of the day, would just walk with God. We'll just hang with God. It's just we're hanging. We're just hanging out together in the garden. Why? Amen. Because <laughs> he wanted to. Because he wanted, he desired to. He found fellowship to be very rich. And whatever questions come up, and I've realized that even with my kids, just hanging around them, every so often they'll ask a really pertinent question. Whereas if I wasn't available or I wasn't hanging with them, they wouldn't ask. Amen? Isn't that the way it is with Daddy? Being with him, you just can ask a question. Or he can just tell you something that's on his heart. Yes, make yourself available to God and prioritize hearing from him for your prophetic words. Can anybody say amen? I say, yeah, you prophesy, but you prophesy from what the Holy Spirit says. But I do believe that there's going to be a season in particular starting this year off that's going to be more prophesying. I actually don't want to prophesy over you, but God's telling me I might have to. That's just my personal, everybody's got their personal spin, right? Things they're comfortable in and things they're not comfortable in. I'm not comfortable there. I'll be honest with you. And it's because of the way I feel about what God wants. He doesn't want me over you and he doesn't want you to think I'm over you. Somebody say amen. And so he hasn't let me. And maybe that's my problem. But I'll tell you what, I, I consider that a very heavy thing to prophesy over somebody. That ain't no little light thing because I'll tell you, if you get your, your flesh in the middle of it and you tell people stuff that ain't true, man, that's a heavy thing. Somebody say amen. That's why the scripture says don't lay hands suddenly. Do you understand that? It's because there's a weighty thing going on when you prophesy over people. And you better be right with God, and you better be willing to be corrected with God. And so I think, but I I do believe we're heading into a prophetic season. Now, how do you prepare for a prophetic season? Prayer. Fasting. Worship. Which one of those songs that you heard this morning was most prophetic? What do you think? What was was the song lineup? Anybody on the worship team, what was the song lineup? Good, good father. Run to the Father. Is that the name of it? Run to the... I See, I don't know. I just... I get back there and go into the zone. That's what happens to me. And, and yeah, you'll hear me babbling back there. If you're uncomfortable with that, come talk to me about speaking in tongues. So number one was run to the Father. What was number two? Louder. I need him. Is that true? Was that number two? King of my heart. Okay, praise God. What was number three? Come on, y'all. You just sang it. <laughs> Where's number three? Anybody remember? Or even the worship team. What was number three? What was on the list number three? Say louder. It is so. I love that song. I believe, that, I mean, at least two of them were prophetically. My encouragement to the worship team, okay? I may be out of line here. There are places where you got to flow with the Spirit and let it keep going. I'm just saying. Maybe this is part of the prophecy, I think. There are places where the Spirit is about to take over where you have to let it go. 
Okay, just receive it from me. There was a place in there where the Holy Spirit wanted to keep it going and just take it down that path. And you could hear it, and I know you guys are listening to it. Listen to the, to the resonance that you're getting back from the room because it will give you cues where it says, no, let, that lil- let it keep going. Because God wants to do, he's, he's, what I'm, what's beautiful about the worship is that it's moving into the prophetic. Anybody agree with me on that? It's moving there. It's going there. Is it, whether you are planning it or not, it's heading there. And so you're going to have to be very sensitive to where God says, don't stop it here, keep it going. Just let it go a little longer. And I believe as you start to do that, God's going to show you what he can do with, uh, with those spaces. Does that make sense? And, and you guys talk about it. Talk about it, pray about it. But there's a prophetic season coming. And that prophetic season is where the Holy Spirit wants to take over. And he wants to help us to move into a new space. Now, our commitment to that might be that we should have a time of prayer and fasting starting next Sunday going to the end of the month, which would be 21 days. Just saying. First of the year. Should we? I think we should. 21 days starting next Sunday. We will give you materials for it, and we will prepare you for that period of time. Are you in agreement with that? Come on, That's, I just need it, you know, prayer and fasting. And we'll talk more about the fasting piece of it. You can fast certain specific things in your life. Um, there's certain ways you can do fasting. It doesn't mean that you go hungry for 21 days. Some of us may do that. Some of us may just say, no, I'm cutting it out. I'm going to do some fruit juice and some water for 21 days. And I'm going to fill that food time with prayer time. Somebody say hallelujah. hallelujah. You're either going to change the spiritual environment you're in or you're not. You're either going to change the year at the beginning or you're not. And if you want to get at the end of the year and say, I wish the year was different, don't do that. I'd rather be at the beginning of the year and say, does God want it to be different? And if God wants it to be different, I want to be available to him, just like we talked about. I want to walk in the cool of the day with the Lord, and I want to hear what he has to say, because those prophetic words will carry me from here to there, and they will transform 2021. I will be in a position where I will hear from God. He will direct me. He will guide me. He will prepare me. And he will put me to work because I'm available for his task. That's what God wants in 2021. If you think it's a year that's going to be like any year, it's not. I believe the the prophetic word is going to be changed for this year. It's going to be get going. It's going to be go the distance. It's going to be get going early so that you can make it all the way. It's going to be get the energy behind you, get the wind behind you, get the Holy Spirit backing you. And what you're doing, it's going to be know which way the wind is blowing so that you go with it. It's going to be that kind of year, I believe. Now, y'all can say, well, he had pizza last night, and that's why he's so weird this morning. I'm okay with that. I'm done. I'm done being popular. Amen? It ain't about being popular. I know Facebook likes sort of tease you into thinking it's about popularity. It's not. It's not. It's either going to be we're going to pursue God and push everything aside or not. That doesn't mean you become holy this year. Somebody say amen. Because I don't know that I, I'm still trying. People are like, you know, people still have the debate of can you be sinless in this, in this world. You know, you can. But they, they challenge it because they haven't seen it. But that doesn't mean I'm not going to try. That doesn't mean I'm not going to set the bar high. That means I'm going to actually strive to chase after God. And if part of that means that I humble myself and I pray and I worship and I just spend time fasting, then I'm, I'm up for it. So get ready. The reason why this is important is, you know, from the 10th to the 31st is 21 days. And we will not only begin on a Sunday, but we will end on a Sunday. Somebody say hallelujah. Maybe that was his idea. Maybe that's his idea. And, and, and actually, the banquet is on the 31st. I didn't even get that one. How many of y'all think maybe there's a plan here? <clears throat> Amen. 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 That's, that's even more, right? So let's make that commitment and pray about it. I'm, I'm the guy that will always say everything you do has to be in you know, without obligation. In other words, you're not doing it because I asked you to. You're not. 
you're, you're doing it because you went to God too and said, God, is this for us? Is this for me? And do I want to participate? Everybody clear on that? That's what I want you to do. I want you to pray. Just like we tithe. I, I'm, I, we could get into, oh, you should give a certain amount. No, I'm not going to be there. You know why? Because you got the Holy Spirit in you too. And so I'm hoping you're praying about it and you're going to give a free will offering based on your love for God. It ain't about me. And so the same thing is true here. You are free to do what God calls you to. We're making an opportunity and we're saying, you know what? One of the things that will solidify our unity is things like this that draw us toward God together. Can you say amen to that? And the message here today is heart and soul or one heart because we are starting to realize that God wants to pull us together. God wants to pull us together. One of the things you're going to have to realize is if the world is getting worse, I know I'm getting a little feedback. How many of you believe the world is getting a little bit worse? It's getting a little darker. Come on. It's okay to say it. It is because I'd rather you be realistic and deal in reality than just fake it. Right? We, don't, we don't need to fake it. We don't need to fake it. The world is getting... Do you know Christians are going to come under increasing attack ideologically? Come on. Now, some of y'all are wincing because it's like, oh, pastor, don't talk about dark stuff. I was like, how else are you going to know when to turn on a light? How else are you going to know that you got to be ready for battle? I, I would be remiss... If I don't bring up issues that then prepare you spiritually, I'm not going to focus on the politics or the issue itself. What I'm going to focus on is, do you understand what God told you is going to be happening so that you are prepared? I would rather you say, Pastor, I thank God you brought that up. You didn't dwell on it. You didn't focus on it. There's still light in the room. But the fact is, you got to realize Christians are going to be increasingly under attack, ideologically. I know people are going to say it's politics. No, actually, some of these things are actual ideology. They're, you guys are against the agenda, and if you're against the agenda, we're going to attack you. We're going to find different ways to attack you. Why do I tell you that? Because you need to be ready for what's coming so that you can defeat what it is. If I don't prepare you for that, man, I, I might as well just go home right now. I need to prepare you for it. But I will continue to show you the light because, you know, being preparing you for the, I'm preparing you for the victory, not the defeat. And because I'm preparing you for the victory, you should be like, hallelujah, whatever tribulation comes my way in the name of Jesus, I defeat it under the blood of Jesus. That's what you should be saying. But there's an element of us being together. There's an element of us being on one accord and of one heart. And in order to win, we know this. Spiritually, we might have to be closer together, t- packed a little tighter, closer to our brothers and sisters, so that we can either wrestle with issues or pray on one accord. Anybody say amen to that? Yes. One of the two. Now, yes, we got to wrestle with some issues. We do, because clearly, even the church is split along some lines it shouldn't be split along. Matter of fact, it shouldn't be split at all, but we won't go there. But it is. You know what? And this is the way I capture that is, if we're all seeking truth, then nothing should tear us apart. That's what we got to do. We got to seek the truth, not our opinions, not our politics, not our left or right ideologies. We should seek the truth. How many of you agree with that? Most people I have that conversation with, are we, shouldn't we seek the truth as Christians? They say, yeah, pastor, we should. Okay, well, let's start, let's start doing that so we do have one heart. But here's the kicker. The only thing that's going to minister to a divided nation or a divided world is a unified body of Christ. Can you say amen? It's the only thing that's going to work. You will not be able to polarize yourself politically or otherwise and help very many people. Because what's happening is a polarization of our nation, our world, and in fact, the only antidote to that is the unity in Christ Jesus. Please say hallelujah. That's the only antidote to it. It's not going to be a world solution because the world started the problem. It's going to be a heavenly solution because the world doesn't know how to fix it. And so our mission is to help fix what's going on in the world. Can you say amen? Amen. That division that you're seeing in the world should remind you that unity is required in the church. The unity of heart, the oneness of heart is going to give us spiritual power against the work of the devil in the world. And we're going to have to learn to wield that power. And I'm going to be the first one to say you alone ain't going to wield it. But pastor, I have all authority. Yeah, I get it, but it ain't working right if you're doing it alone. Come on. 
It ain't working right if you're outside the body. It wasn't meant to work out there. It's like my hand laying on the street. Is that really where my hand is supposed to work? No, it's supposed to work in the body. And when the hand is connected to the body, it can do some mighty things. Somebody say amen. Matter of fact, I can pull the hand back when it's not supposed to be out there. Somebody say hallelujah. In other words, the arm can say, no, nope, you weren't supposed to do that. I'm going to pull you back. And the hand may not like it. Wait, what are you doing, arm? You, you, you're not my boss. Well, right now in the body I am, and I need to pull your butt back. Can you say amen? You see, there's safety in the body. There's safety in the connectedness of being of one heart. Now, the next thing you're going to say is, does that mean we all have to agree? Absolutely not. The only thing we got to agree on is that Jesus is Lord. Can you say amen? But after we agree on that, we have to submit to that same Lord and let him be Lord of our lives. You know what that means? He's not only your Savior, but he's your Lord. That means he tells you what to do, and you do it. That's right. That's right. Imagine that, that we would submit ourselves to the, the commander-in-chief. And the commander-in-chief is Jesus Christ. Amen. See, because when we submit ourselves to him, you see why prayer and fasting has to go first? Because we got to get his agenda, and then we got to walk it out the rest of the year. Can you say amen? amen. And if we're going to go the distance, we're going to get ready. We're going to get set. We're going to get results. Amen. We're going to get ready, we're going to get set, we're going to get going, and we're going to get results. And that's the vision that we're seeing God bring forward. Does that make sense? And yeah, it's going to start with, with us being on one page and one accord. And are we going to agree? No. But it is actually in our disagreement that we're going to find strength. It's actually in our differences that we're going to find the wisdom of God. That's where we're going to find it. Why? Because we're of one heart and we're, we're serving one Lord. And therefore, that information and that perspective is available for the whole body. Did you hear what I just said? Do you see the vision for that? That's what Christ wants. You see these pictures that we see in our politics. Do you know the whole world is watching America? America's politics? Do you know why they're watching it? Because we're the best example on the whole planet. My German friends are like, yeah, we're watching you guys, and you're little knuckleheads. We don't know if you're going to pull it off, but you're the best that we got. They're all around the world. People are watching our politics, and we have some of the best. And even ours is dysfunctional. Somebody say amen. They're looking at us saying, man, we're watching you because if you guys go weird, we're going to go weird. They know that America sets the standard and the direction for freedom. How many of you know that? America is setting the standard because it has consistently been the moral leader regardless of how perfect it is. Now let me show you something because this is what happens to Christians. The day one of us makes a mistake, we make the other mistake of saying our mistake ruins the gospel. That is absolutely wrong. Our mistake doesn't ruin the gospel. Men who fall don't Taint the gospel. Stop believing that. That's not true. Because here's why. Because God in his gospel said, it's not about you. No flesh is going to glory before me. It's about me. Can anybody say amen? He established the gospel. It's Christ, not Steve. And so when you find out for some reason that I have sin in my life, don't fall away from God. When you find out some famous guy does some really stupid things in his flesh and yet he's got a, a track record of really good things don't you dare fall away from christ who the heck said this guy was the was the archetype of christianity who said that nobody christ is the archetype of christianity stop looking at idols and then saying, well i can't serve god because this guy fell away that's not god you missed it he missed it too, but now you're missing it. See, we have done some things where we have put idols in front of our eyes that have caused us to fall away from God, and we are going to have to be very diligent about removing those idols from out of our lives. We're going to have to cauterize it. What does the Scripture say about if your eye offends you, what should you do? You should cut it out. I realize this is a very prophetic message, but maybe that's what we need. And for some of us, you're going to be like, well, pastor, man, you're getting sort of tough. Maybe that's what we need. Maybe that's what we need. We're dealing with a tough world. We're dealing with division in this nation. As I've never seen this before. Now, some of y'all ain't even looking. I'm going to be honest with you. 
Some of y'all want to turn your head and say it ain't happening. And I'm going to challenge you. Open your eyes and don't be afraid. Open your eyes, don't be afraid. See, because it's not, the, it's not based on man's plans, it's based on God's will. So if you open your eyes, you'll get to see what his plan is. Somebody say amen. Come out of the cave and see what his plan is. Oh, mighty man of valor. Two out of 10 of 12 of those spies were wrong. Excuse me, 10 out of 12 of those spies were wrong. The two were right. Now, it took a while. Amen? It took a while. And actually, nobody went in because the ten told the wrong story. And because they were afraid, because they saw this, what, was, what was before them in the flesh, and they couldn't see in the spirit. Don't let us be that. This church is going to be, one of the, is going to be two of the twelve. Somebody say amen. 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 I, we can look at it. I see them. They're bigger, but that don't mean nothing. I see them. I see them. Yes, they are taller than usual. But that don't make us grasshoppers. They are taller than usual. They're bigger. They got more weapons. I get all that. But the fact is, God is bigger than them, and that's where I should be focusing. So that is going to give us courage, but we're going to have to be able to open our eyes and see, eyes wide open, and see what's really happening and deal with what's really happening, not putting our head in the sand and saying, oh, it's all going to be all right. No, we're going to have to make some choices. Do you realize America is one of the first places in history where the people of America actually make the choice? For, for eons, for millennia, people didn't get a choice of leader. It dawned on me. I was like, oh, my God. Because we're debating whether we should be actively engaged and whether we should believe and pray. As if we should let our hands off the wheel and just let God own it. I don't think so. I believe God is calling us to take ownership of it. How do I know? Because if you read again in, in Second Chronicles, what the picture he's painting is, when, and God is speaking, he says, when I allowed the pestilence, when my people, the, he's, he's counting on us. My people, that's the context. The context is pestilence, and God's saying, I allowed it. Clearly, God allowed it. Somebody say amen. And then he said, but if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, I will heal, hear them from heaven. I will, I will forgive their sins and I will heal their land. Somebody say hallelujah. Do you know that scripture is actually for today? Do you know it wasn't? It was written a long time ago, but I'm telling you, the reason the word of God is powerful is because it is timeless. What that means is I can take something from way back then and apply it to now, and the spiritual principles still work. Can you say amen? What we should be doing in the face of pestilence is actually taking authority over the land and praying God's will over the land. One of those songs was bringing heaven down to earth. Did you hear the song? It was prophetically saying, bring heaven down to earth. Pray what God is saying. It is so. I mean, it is getting us the message God is talking to us. And I believe God isn't saying hide and disconnect. He's saying engage and have faith. He's saying get up and get moving. I am not advocating, because you always got to put these things out there. I am not advocating that people be foolish. I'm not saying, because some, somebody's going to go tactical on me and they're going to say, oh, pastor, you're saying that you shouldn't wear a mask. Did I say that? You should just go and forget about what's going on. No, did I say that? I did not. Now, you got to do what you got to do, but you got to listen to God and you got to get out there. And God may call you forth and say, oh, mighty man of valor, I know you're not, I know you're afraid, but I, you need to get up and I will protect you. Can anybody say amen? And he will show you how to use wisdom and also discernment to get moving because he may not want you to be sitting where you're sitting. He may want you to get up out of the seat and we might have to trust him. But remember, us praying and seeking God was in the context of pestilence that God allowed. Somebody say you heard me. Read it. Read it. And that's another encouragement. When you read the word of God, always go before and after what you're, what you're, what you're quoting. Because you need context. You need to understand why God said that and what context he said it in. You wonder why you should read the word of God. And oh, by the way, guess what day it is? It is January 3rd. Hey, remember your one-year Bible. Even if you don't come to Bible class, get in your Bible and start it over again. Somebody say hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. And yeah, you can get any translation you want. I don't, shoot, I'm good. I'm good. 
Hallelujah. Get into the Word of God and do it and set those tones now. Amen? But the only thing that's going to minister to a divided nation, if you believe it's divided, and I do, I believe it is, and I believe there's just crazy stuff going on, and I stay in it long enough for it not to change my heart, I stay in it long enough to be aware and knowledgeable about what's going on, because there are a lot of people that ask questions that need solid answers. They need more than just have faith. Somebody say amen. They need, you know, people have questions about creation. They need more than just have faith. Oh, just believe. That doesn't always work because we live in a real world where there are real questions, and so real Christians have to have real answers. Somebody say amen. Amen. Come on. (laughs) Real Christians have to have real answers. You can't just say, well, just read the Word of God. No, maybe they're not going to read the Word, and and, and maybe they need some logic. Somebody say amen. Amen. Logic's a big, big idea. Logic came from God. Science comes from God. Somebody say hallelujah. You think I'm abdicating science because somebody said it's scientific, follow the science. Yeah? Well, let's think about that. Let's debate that. Let's have a conversation about the science. Now, I thank God daily in this season that, that my mama sent me to a, a math and science um, um, school. I thank God because they're pulling the wool over all kinds of people saying it's science. Somebody's saying, I know I'm digging up some, some, some groundhogs. I know there's some groundhogs that are running around now because I unearthed them. I understand that. But God said to be wise as a serpent. Do you know what that means? Can anybody paraphrase it for me? What is it to be wise as serpents yet gentle as doves? Because that's what he said we were supposed to be. What is it to be wise as a serpent? Anybody can shout out. What is that? Okay. Know what's going on. What was the second part? Be loving. Oh, I love that. Praise the Lord. You need to come up and preach the rest of this. Know what's going on, but be loving and trying to fix it. How many of you could buy into that? I can be one with you on that. Absolutely. Know what's going on. Be honest about what the truth of the reality is, but be loving and trying to fix it. Absolutely. You had something, too. I 100% agree with that because I got news for you. We're, we're being snookered by all kinds of channels of media. It, the, the amazing thing about this nation right now, I know, you're going to be like, he just ranted it this first Sunday. I can watch one media and go one story and go to another media and get another story. What does that tell you? There's no consistency. Nobody's on the same page. Somebody's lying. <laughs> They're probably both wrong, but at the very least, somebody's, somebody's lying to you. Oh, come on. Am I the only one? I, I'm trying to be authentic here. Somebody's lying to you. And if you're in an environment where people are lying to you, the worst thing you could be is dumb as a sheep. You got to be wise as a serpent. What that means to me is the devil can't outsmart you. That you are so willing to understand and dig and study and, f- and frame and know who's lying to you that you know what the truth is. Can anybody say amen? amen. See, because it's the truth is what sets you free, ain't it? Yeah. So you might have to do some study. Yeah. You might have to dig into it. You might have to say to yourself, man, I'm not smart enough on that topic, but let me get around some people that are. Can you say amen? Now you see why the body becomes important. There's people in the body that get some of these topics. There are people in the body that you should be talking to and listening to and allowing them to help you understand some of the principles and fundamentals of these things. Can anybody say amen? See, this is why the church has to be of one heart, not one mind necessarily. We have to have the mind of Christ, but the one-heartedness is what brings us together to have the conversation. Can anybody say amen to that? It's a precursor to unity. Uh, that one-heartedness is what's going to help us heal our body and then heal the world. Can anybody say amen to that? Because our goal is to help the world, isn't it? Our goal is to have the answers. For, I mean, shoot. I mean, that's why you study the Word of God, so you have some answers for people. Not just that you beat them over the head and say, well, you're not a Christian, and, and so you're less than me. No. That's actually the opposite of what we should be doing. Matter of fact, we're supposed to teach with the big H word called humility. We're supposed to encourage one another. We're supposed to be soft and tender towards one another. Somebody say amen. But pastor, we politically disagree. I don't care. 
There is no reason to be mean-spirited and evil toward one another. Is there any question about that? There is no reason to disparage one another. There's no reason to say, well, I can't talk to him because he disagrees with me. So what? You might learn something if you did talk to him. The body has to come together. And this is the way we're going to let we're going to balance out some of the things in the world that are that are either lies, outright lies, lies. There are some. Somebody say amen. There are some outright lies out there, man. And people are getting led astray because nobody's speaking up, and because Christians are cowering in the caves, saying, "Oh, I can't talk about that." Yeah, you better. You better talk about it. And yes, people get. I know it. When I preach about you know purity and you know being. I mean, I know I, I make people uncomfortable, but I would rather make you uncomfortable than let you keep walking in a way that's going to destroy you or somebody else. My responsibility is not always to make you comfortable. Sometimes my responsibility is to point out the pothole you're headed toward because you believe a lie, and that lie is setting you in on a course that's going to destroy you and other people. And so, yes, at this point in my life, I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. We are awfully self-indulgent as a culture. We are awfully self-centered. Everything's about us. Like, oh, I get to do what I want to do regardless of who else it impacts. I got news for you. God cares about the other people that it impacts. God does care. He cares. Some of the things that we believe are lies that destroy other people. Is it okay for us to continue to believe those lies? Of course not, because Jesus Christ is going to come and rule and reign, and in the meantime, the kingdom's tr truth has to come forward. It has to. Who's going to tell it if you won't? Who's going to know it if you don't? That's why. And no, you, you'll notice in our values, preference-free is one of them. I, 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 somehow, look, let me tell you. As members of the kingdom of God, I have no right to tell you what to believe politically. I can encourage you. I can talk to you. We can debate things. We can go back and forth. But I still have to accept you as a child of God. Is that okay? Same thing goes for me, bro. Because this covenant is two ways. Pastor, you don't get to think like that. I've had people say that to me. And I said, you know what? You're not really a friend of mine. I do get to think that way. Amen? And when we have debates, I'm going to tell you what I think. I could be wrong. I could be flat wrong, but I might be right. And so at some level, we get in this world, and as Christians, we have the right to take positions. We have the right to think things through and apply God's principles to come to a conclusion. Amen? Amen? We, we, we can't reason together if nobody's reasoning. Right. In order for us to reason, we're going to have to dig in the issues and understand what's going on and be willing to find the truth and then be willing to put it on the table and have a debate about it. Do you see that? Right. It's because we're not debating it is that we're still apart. And the world can't debate it because they don't have one heart. Can you say amen? Yeah. That's what's happening. See, our bicameral system in the polit political realm is supposed to work together because they're supposed to be on a single agenda. Part of what's going on is they're not. And so they have nothing to bring them together. The church is the solution to that. Amen? Man, I haven't gotten the scripture yet, have I? I just, I, it's just, you just, maybe not. Praise God. And there's always next week. Because hallelujah, I'm good. Man, I can send you a text. And no, God didn't tell me not to think about stuff. That's the other thing. I'm, just, I'm not going to let you put me in a box around things like that, and you shouldn't be in one. God told us to use our mental faculties. You know, when Moses actually spent 40 years in the world, he, knew, he learned some things. And God used it in, in the kingdom. He, he, there's people that know some stuff that you're going to have to listen to them or actually entertain the fact that maybe they know something more than you do. And if they have a perspective, open your ears, be at least willing to hear it, and seek truth together. Does that make sense? Yes, That's what the body has to learn to do. We are in a season where it's going to be critical that we start to do it more because the answers are only going to come from people willing to seek truth, debate truth, and find truth. Can you say amen? Yes. It's the only way it's going to happen. 
because there's so much stuff going on in the world. Now, I will point you to something, and I'll just read. I've got to read one scripture. And I'm going to point you to something that we've prepared. Um, if you go to your app, how many of you have the Sozo Loveland app? Praise God, good. And this is for after. I don't, you don't have to go there now. But if you go to connect and then look for sermon notes, guess what? we got sermon notes in there. So you will see what I was supposed to say today. And there might be something interesting in it. Praise God. There might be something really good there. So get ready for next week by looking what I was supposed to say this, this week. Somebody say hallelujah. Amen. And I'm just going to read one scripture because that's all we got. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1. I am, and, and let me tell you something, this ain't going away. It ain't going away. And so what you're hearing in my gut is how God really is calling me to be a little bit, a little bit more bold and direct on some things, okay? He is. You're going to have to forgive me, but maybe you won't, and it won't matter. Somebody say amen. Um, because I'm going to speak what he's telling me to speak. And I'm going to say, and I'm going to challenge us where he wants us to, because you know what's at stake? Lives and souls. And so, and so he's like, well, what are you going to do with these? You, you're not going to warn them. You're not going to show them. You're not going to empower them and help them see what the spiritual tenor is in this world and how to defeat it. You're not going to tell them. See, because he'll take me out. I'm going to heaven. Don't worry about me. But he'll take me out. He will take me out. He'll say, you're not qualified because you won't tell them the truth. And he will disqualify me if I don't step up and say what needs to be said. Amen? So just bear with me. I think it's going to bring us to more clarity. I think it's going to bring us to more freedom in, in how we walk. But it should start bringing us together in a way that's going to be helpful spiritually. Amen? 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1 says, But realize this, that in the last days difficult times will come. For men will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, revilers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, malicious gossips, without self-control, brutal, haters of good. And this is the world that we're stepping into. We are actually stepping into a season in America where that division could destroy America. I believe. You don't have to agree with me. It could destroy America. We are at, I've never seen anything like this. And it is a combination of things, including open deception and lies promoted that people are supposed to, you know, you know believe. And, and there are two channels. There's two, almost two sets of information going on. I got to tell you. And if you're on one side, you believe one thing. And if you're on the other side, you believe something else. So we're going to have to chase truth together. We're going to have to decide, okay, let's challenge what we know and believe so that we can come together around the truth of God. Somebody say amen. Because the truth is going to set us free from this deception and this delusion that's going on in our nation. It's going to elevate us above it. And then we're going to have to be the bridge builders and peacemakers to bring it together. Somebody say amen. It's not to take you out. It's to make you more effective in it. It's not to push you aside. It's not to make you, oh, I know the truth, so therefore I'm better than everybody. No. If you know the truth, you're going to have to share the truth. And you're going to have to do it with love because there are people who are going to have to listen to you. Somebody say amen. They're going to have to receive the truth because you're supposed to speak the truth in love so that we might all grow up into the head, namely Christ. I am not preaching anything but what God is telling us to do and has told us to do. My tension is that we're not doing it. We're not there. I will take personal responsibility because I believe the pastors in the pulpits are going to have to step the heck up. Pastors in the pulpits that are going to have to preach truth and help people see it and love people to the truth so that they can be free, my God. God put pastors in pulpits all over this nation, black ones, white ones, all kinds of colors, and they're the secret weapon in America. This is why I push back on people that are like, well, there was slavery. You know if there was not slavery, there may not be as many black pastors in pulpits today. Do you understand that even the very thing that the devil wanted for for evil, God can turn to good? Do you understand that God can take dry bones and put them back together and put sinew on them and put blood in them and raise them up and everybody's freaking out because they saw life come to what was dead? 
And they say, clearly that was God. See, we want to do it ourselves, and God's saying, you can't, and I'm ready and able to do it. But you're going to have to see some dry bones come together to understand and humble yourself before the mighty hand of God. Can anybody say amen? Amen. You're going to have to see some resurrections happen. I used to think it was just that we would, that was about the show. Raising people from the dead was about the show. Well, just two things have become true. Every person that comes to Jesus was raised from the dead. That's number one. You want to save some, you want to save some people. Don't let them die. Don't let them die. Save them with the gospel. Get them the truth. And you'll be able to stand there and say, yes, Lord Jesus, I raised some people from the dead. Because they were going to hell and now they're not. Somebody say amen. The other part of that that's so important is only one person can raise you from the dead. There's only one person that can raise you from the dead. Physically, spiritually, there's only one man that can raise you from the dead. And so then we humble ourselves. It ain't me, by the way. It ain't you. It ain't you. So we can all proudly put our arms around each other and just say, I'm glad it's not me. I'm glad it's not you. I'm glad it's him. Remember this. We will watch men fall. We will watch them be men. But don't you ever let that cause you to lean away from God. Man, I'll tell you what. He said, no flesh is going to glory before me. So if you made a certain man an idol, that's why you're upset. Don't be. Don't let anyone be an idol between you and God. Does that make sense? Now, this was totally nonsensical. This was totally off the wall. But maybe I should stop praying so much because I don't think God's going to keep me in a box. I think he's going to let me wander free like a, like a horse running out on a range, man. And he's going to be like, no, I want you to run free. And in running free, I'm going to give you the words to speak. Amen? Stand